And this evening, we're going to talk about the middle way as avoidance of extremes. Let me turn around. Well, it's, it's hard to face the camera and face everybody else. Unless I'm all the way back here. Huh? We're out, we're totally opposite. You're there anyway, so, yeah. Um, so this evening, I, I want to talk about the middle way as avoidance of extremes. And you should have received uh, the handout in the link that was sent out earlier today. So you've got what I've got. Uh, and often I put this under the rubric of basic Buddhism. Um, and it is certainly basic Buddhism. But I, I think that it's a, this topic is especially important um, right now. And also I want to caution people as to what the middle way is. So there's, there's a couple of different aspects of that. And in the first meaning of the middle way, as I say on here, Shakyamuni Buddha began his first discourse instructing the people to take the middle path between extreme asceticism on one hand and sensual indulgence on the other. And the reason it's phrased that way is because he had, in the time before he had become awakened, he lived as a part of the aristocracy. And his father even protected him from all the negative influences that one might encounter in life. And um, as a result, he, re he realized that that didn't necessarily make him happier or a better person or anything along those lines. And that's one of the reasons he left his father's palace because he was looking for what is the nature of reality, the, the experience that I'm, ha that I'm having here living in this palace-like environment is not reality. This is reality from my experiences day to day, moment to moment, but it's not a reality that's any more than that. And so he then became a renunciant and went about and um, explored for approximately six years with three different gurus um, what reality might be in a spiritual context in that environment. And after six years, he realized that he clearly was not um, getting what he was looking for there. Now, part of what he was experiencing also was studying with gurus who were um, practiced austerities and a very ascetic lifestyle. And by ascetic, what we're talking about is in India at that time, there still are gurus who advocate eating one fig a day. That's their entire diet and wearing no clothes or very scantily dressed and uh, really punishing the body in various ways. And so he rejected that. Um, also, and because he realized that that wasn't all, that also wasn't bringing him to awakening. So on one hand, you had the indulgence in sensual pleasures, and on the other hand, you had this very austere, ascetic lifestyle, and both were not assisting him in attaining or achieving an understanding of the nature of reality. And so from the very beginning, Shasana, the Buddha path, was really dedicated in many ways to exactly that, the middle way. And he, there's a seat right there. Uh, I don't know if you, if, you know, if you're willing to sit next to Elizabeth, you know. Be my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that I think was, was really instrumental was the, the maid um, who assisted him, the milk, the milkmaid, Sujata, who assisted him, came across him when he was sitting under a tree and um, was really just skin and bones, um, almost lifeless. And she realized that he was in need of assistance, and so she offered him... Um, a gruel made with rice and milk and that rejuvenated him and brought him vitality and, and 
he then, shortly after that, went on to sit under the what we now refer to as the Bodhi tree and attained awakening. And so the very first teaching that he gave after that, uh, now it depends upon which which account you're reading, but one account is the very first teaching that he gave really had to do with the middle way and the Eightfold Path as the um, mechanism for attaining the middle way and, and maintaining, not attaining, but maintaining the middle way. And we have to make a, a, an, a slight tangent here to note that when we talk about the middle way, we talk about the experience that I just described to you, but at the same time, we can talk about the more philosophical. And that would, hold on just for a moment. Kandin, could you give me a small glass of, you know, a medium glass of seltzer? My throat is getting really dry. Um, and then we can we can look at the the Majamika philosophic school, and the Majamika really is translated as the middle way school. And so that was that was um, attributed to Nagarjuna. And so we have the middle way as that which is the path between the two extremes of sensual indulgences and austerities and ascetic practices. But as Buddhism developed then, and the philosophy developed, there also developed within it, the Majamaka school of philosophy, which embodied the notion of the middle way. And that's a little bit different. I mean, it, it, it touches upon what we were just discussing, but it expands it a little bit differently because and I'm going to make a point of this in just a moment. The middle way. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Because the middle way, according to Nagarjuna, was the middle way between existence and non-existence. And that was a very important philosophical departure. One of the examples of how Shakyamuni Buddha applied the middle way as philosophy is it's reported in the Pali Canon that I'm going to turn and talk to you guys for a moment. <laughs> it's reported in the Pali Canon that <clears throat> Shakyamuni Buddha was asked about the nature of self. Is there a self? There is not a self. And remember that this was a really important question because Hinduism purports and the Vedic teachings purport the self as a um, eternal entity that goes throughout lifetimes from one to the next to the next, etc. And Buddhism was purporting the not self through shunyata as, as an aspect of shunyata or what we refer to often as emptiness misreport perhaps as emptiness. And what was interesting about this, and I think that this gives us pause when we, for people who are trying to explain to others the nature of Buddhist philosophy, because on one hand, we're taught that Buddhist teachings maintain the idea of not self, as opposed to many other teachings which purport an eternal self. Shakyamuni Buddha is asked the question, he didn't respond. And the reason he didn't wish to respond is because if he said, yes, there is a self, then he's um, adhering to what would be referred to as eternalism. And if he didn't respond, and if he responded about not self, now he's arguing for non-existence. It's going back to the same issue that Nagarjuna was dealing with between existence and non-existence. And he felt that people would not understand not self except as a non existent except in a non-existent context. And so he kept quiet. 
He never responded to that to that question. And so Nagarjuna then, it, it philosophically, the Nagarjuna school, I say, philosophically took up this issue and began to look at uh, the nature of the middle way. And in this perspective, the middle way shunyata is empty of sensation, conception, discrimination, awareness, but full of creative potential. And the idea of the middle way is that you have in this, and along with the Tiantai Tendai perspective, you have that which is the provisional world, the concrete world that we seem to live in at this moment. And you have the absolute world of Shunyata. And that, in fact, this wasn't the argument of, of Nagarjuna. This came a little bit later with the Tiantai. But in fact, the two are the same. There was no distinction between the absolute and the, uh, and the provisional or the conditional world would be another, another way to state it. The conditional and the non-conditional, two ways of looking at, at the universe. And so <clears throat> we then go into, and I just put down here the middle way as the eightfold path, because we often do not teach it that the eightfold, we teach the eightfold path is a response to how does one uh, you know, we, we look at the fourfold truth, and the fourfold truth starts with with the dukkha, often translated as suffering, and goes on that, that that life is has elements of suffering throughout it, and that the, and just so the people who saw Ichishima Sensei disappear, he had to leave after a few minutes because he has a service that he has to attend to uh, this morning at the temple, so. He didn't, he didn't leave us because he, it's a, a kind of a philosophical statement. <laughs> he left because it's got to be something else. Okay. Um, anyway, so we're, we're, what was I talking about before he left? John, help me out here. Four Noble Truths. Four Noble Four Truths. Four, yeah. Four, so Four suffering, dukkha, and that, um, that there is a, that furthermore, that the suffering is caused by attachments and, and the things that we're all aware of. And that there is then a way out of this suffering, and the way out of the suffering is the Eightfold Noble Path, and that's the way it's normally taught. That's the that's the catechism, so to speak. If 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 Buddhism as a whole had a catechism, that would be it. And but in fact, he was teaching the Eightfold Path as the mechanism of the middle way. Which I and I think that that places both the eightfold path in a different perspective, and also gives us a different perspective on the middle way. And of course, as I, I put it down here, there's there's wisdom, morality, and ethics, and samadhi that the eight elements fall into one of those three three categories, and that by following the eightfold path, one will be following the middle way, and that's that's really important in this context. Um, now, and, and I'm, I'm leaving some time for plenty of time for discussion this evening. Um, and I also don't want to end up in the hondo at half past uh, eight, which sometimes happens after we have discussion and, and go on. The middle way of, explore, of, of, of avoiding extremes does not imply a middle of the road approach to life. And I think that we sometimes mistake that. We hear the middle way, it's a way of, it is a way of moderation, avoiding extremes. But we also think about it, oh, so this is the, the middle of the road way of life, to stay out of trouble, so to speak. That's often how it's implied. Um, however, the middle way does not imply, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, during the Dharma talk tonight, I decided to talk to discuss it in that context. The middle of the of the middle way doesn't imply that you cannot experience intense activities that require concentrated effort. It doesn't say, therefore, that you should avoid 
things that are that require a lot of effort. That's not what it's saying. Or that you shouldn't do those things which might seem, uh, in fact, radical in some cases. It's discussing sensual indulgence, uh, sensual indulgences and aesthetic extremes. That's what it's describing specifically. It's discussing it in a spiritual context. Now, I would not object to people saying that moderation is really good for us anyway. Um, I, I think that if we have too much to eat, <laughs> you know, all the time we get fat. If we drink too much alcohol, we're going to become an alcoholic. Uh, if we live an ascetic lifestyle uh, just by ourselves in our room, we're probably going to get depressed and we're not going to contribute to anybody, you know, <laughs> so that, that that middle way in that context, living a life of moderation, and one can speak to it. I, I was thinking uh, as I was putting this together earlier today that in some ways there are, you know, there are the people who are going to eat too much too often and really as a, but that's a, that's a sensual indulgence essentially um, that, but at the same time, a person who goes on crash diets one after the other is another form of extreme. You know, one, one is eating too much all the time and the crash diet in order to lose the weight is the other side of that same, of that same dualism, you know? Uh, so we see it, we see it in everyday life. Um, but it's really necessary to follow the eightfold path in, in all of these. And I'm not going to discuss the eightfold path now because that deserves its own, its own discussion at some, some other time. But again, I just want to go back and say that it's really interesting that from Shakyamuni Buddha's perspective, the way to follow the, the middle way was through the Eightfold Path. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, as well as right effort, mindfulness, concentration. So I'm going to leave it there and ask if people have some questions. No questions. It's not apparent to me that the Eightfold Noble Path uh, is equal to uh, Middle Way. Except the fact that Shakyamuni Buddha said it was. Well, I'm, I <laughs> yeah. It's because if it's because if we use um, if we just look at Prajna wisdom as an example, yeah, then right view and right intention. If you have the right intent, what what do we mean by right view and right intention? Well, right view to begin with is uh, at its very basic means to follow the four noble truths. Okay, that's that's inherent within that. And if one is doing that, um, then one is going to recognize the idea of the middle way. One hand, on one hand, being sensual indulgences, and on the other hand, being uh, austerities, and as part of the suffering that we are involved with, they're part of attachment. And just as one example. Oh, say. Maybe a way to explain it is, is, as you have there on the chart, break the eightfold path into threefold practice. Mm -hmm. So the threefold practice, that of right living, um, right dharma, and, and right meditation. And simply put that if someone is not very moral in their life, they're full of um, wrongdoing, it's going to be very hard for them to enter a state where they might have calm and clear understanding of things, right? Meditation. And without that, they're not going to have the right wisdom, they're not going to be able to understand the non duality of things and the interpenetration of things. So, again, if I, my life is messed up, I'm not going to get calm and clear. And therefore, I'm never going to really understand non dualism because I'm never going to release my attachment to me being me and all that. Yeah. So the Buddha is saying that by going through the 
eightfold path, which is divided up into threefold practice, one can learn the middle way. Now, again, as you articulated here, uh, time goes on and the middle way starts to morph a little bit more into this thing of the other two extremes that we come across, whatever they might be, good and evil, uh, whatever the two extremes, and, 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 and we see the two truths doctrine. And we start to see that, well, there aren't really two extremes. They are just two aspects of the same thing. But I'd like to kind of draw Kaiden into a conversation here a bit. One of my most enjoyable times I've had through the pandemic was the train ride with you back from New York City. Because we spent at least an hour and a half talking about the 3,000 worlds in a single bottom, <laughs> which is really Chigi's teachings of the Middle Way. I really wonder what the person sitting behind us on that train was thinking <laughs> about us for that for hours. <laughs> Even if we were cultists or professors. He was, <laughs> he was, he was probably saying, Where, where's my sound deadening headphones when I need them? <laughs> but but uh, Kai, you have uh, probably studied as much as any of us around the 3,000 troops, or 3,000. Um, um, 2,000 realms in one yeah, moment. In, in, Single thought moment. And, and, and again, <clears throat> this is a meditation practice that GD has. It's just a tool. Uh, and which he shows that actually he uses the duality, that you have to be in two realms. Otherwise, the Buddha needs to be in the Buddha, there needs to be the Buddha realm at the same time as the hell realm, or else you can't have compassion. It takes opposites in order to manifest something. Without an other, you can't have a, even an, an it. So it needs an other, but now how do we understand the middle way? And this is where he uses the 3,000 worlds or realms of the single thought realm. Uh, so it, um, we'll just share a little bit of that one poll. Well, there's, yeah. there's an idea that goes back to um, much earlier. I think it's from the Pali Canon where the Buddha is asked to explain what this idea of right means in the context of the Eightfold Path. And there's the parable of the harp player tuning his instrument, right? And basically the analogy is if you tighten the strings too tight, they break. If you leave them too loose, they don't play the correct note, right? And that we should think in, of right sort of in those terms where there's, with the case of the string, there's an appropriate tension, right? There's a place where it's exactly correct to do what you're trying to do with it. And that's a middle way. Right. And so it's not so much, you know, a right or correct that's static. It's something that it changes. I mean, it's the it's the harmony between those two things. And I think that really with with Master G's teaching of the three thousand realms in a in a single thought moment, it kind of takes that idea. And then really shows you how, if things are totally interpenetrated, how much more complicated that idea of a middle path really becomes. Right? 3, yeah, so in that case, you, you can have these 3,000 permutations, which is the number that he picks based on yeah. doctrinal reasons, right? That's but, GE's teaching. So it could be 6,000 right, reasons, right. but it's not Buddhist teaching. So GE's teachings are Buddhist teachings. Well, it's based on the Lotus Sutra. That's it's where based it's from Lotus Lotus from. Yeah. yeah. So you can't say it's Chigi's teachings, it's not Buddhist teachings, it's Buddhist teachings. I mean, what was Chigi? It wasn't a Muslim. Oh, you mean Buddha, the like Shakyamuni? Like, the Buddha. like right, right, right. Yeah. Right. But, but we're Mahayana. Uh, so there was not one Buddha. That's you'd have to go to the Pali group to appreciate that. <laughs> but again, the point is that it comes directly out of a verse, actually about two paragraphs, right, of the um, Lotus Sutra. Well, it's, it's sort of a combination. You have the only a Buddha together with a Buddha, which gets right. you into the into these okay. two realms sort of juxtaposed. You can have multiple Buddhas in a single world system, right, which is sort of unheard of previously. But then also, you know, the idea of the 10 realms interpenetrating as well as the 10 suchnesses or such like characteristics. And so if you have every possible combination of that, you know, across the form, formless and desire realms, then you get the 3000 realms, right? But I mean, the 3000 is the number that he picked to show this idea of all possible combinations being in play. 
But I think a key point is, is that, as you point out, the harmony between strings as being another concept of middle way of rightness. What is the right pitch? And that, in that sense, using the term correct livelihood or correct. As many people do. As many people do. The, it's, it's sometimes a better. Yeah, I mean, the maybe better rendition of right that. speech might be the one time that, it, that right, right is actually the right word. Right, but it goes to the but, heart of the idea of skillful means. Right. But if you take the three thousand in this case harmonies, that anytime you pair something, you can take the three thousand harmonies and start to meditate on that. That's what he asks us to do. He doesn't ask us to understand it. He asks us to meditate, and, and that is the ultimate meditation on the way. Because imagine meditating on. It's like meditating on um, Indra's web. It's the same thing. Oh, yeah. Indra's web. Indra's web. It's like meditating on that. Just mm -hmm. meditating on that total complexity of balance and reflection. Yeah. And that has to do with the eighth hole. It does. It, it exactly balance. does. Yeah. It, it does because uh, by finding this type of harmony and balance in yourself, that's where you strike this get the part where your life is in balance so that your calm and clear meditation is in balance so that your understanding of non-duality and your penetration is realized. And that is why we're practicing. Or to look at it, you've got, you've got the wisdom, you've got Dhyana, and you've got Shila. So Shila is morals and ethics. Chigi is asked, what do I do to meditate? He doesn't say initially, this isn't a question and answer at the end of uh, Mahatma Shikhan. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say, you sit down, you put one leg on the other, you put this leg on there. He does that in other places, but that's when asked the question. He said, first, you have to practice Shila. You have to practice yeah. morality, right. etc." The reason for that is you have to practice the middle way. Those things are the middle way. If you're not practicing that, your meditation is going to be not productive. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and in the same way that now you you go on and you look at at wisdom. Wisdom is to recognize that attachment is what leads us to all kinds of problems. The middle way is not to be attached. The middle way is to accept the notion of non-attachment. That is the middle way. And again, part of that harmony of the strings is that doesn't mean, as you say, in the end, not being responsible. Right. Uh, uh, you could say, well, I'm not attached, therefore I'm not responsible. No, you're not attached. You are responsible. That's the harmony. That's the harmony. Yeah. Yeah. So, to, you know, I, to me, it's very clear that the, that the Eightfold Path is, in fact, the middle way. Because when you read through it, if you take it just one piece and you look at it one piece without looking at the entirety of it, well, you could say, well, I don't see what this has got to do with it. Well, it probably doesn't unless you look at it holistically and, and look at it as, as part of a larger complex. Are there some other questions that people might have? Good evening, you say. I just see you joined us a little while ago. Any questions from the uh, the green boxes? <laughs> yes, Brian. I, I um, okay. I, I'm not sure. It's not so much a question, but it's like when I read this, I remembered a cartoon from the New Yorker I saw when I was a teenager that, before I even know knew anything about Buddhism, I put on my wall because it meant something to me, and it showed a football player crossing a goal line with a football. And the caption read, very nice, but don't lose perspective. <laughs> and, and it was funny. And it's always stuck with me of the, the thousands of cartoons in the New Yorker I've seen since I was a teenager. And when I read this, it all came back to me that, that I always admired that cartoon, that that was the way to live. And I, maybe I don't get it in the head part, but I know that when I try to live the middle path, I always find a certain sense of, I know one of the four sublimes, um, equanimity, the hard one for me, comes just from doing that, that, gosh, this is a really fantastic, like I had dinner with my husband on Sunday at a restaurant we like. I said it was a fantastic dinner, but I reminded myself as we were walking from the restaurant back to our apartment, that that walk I was now on 
was just as fantastic, that I had to kind of let go of that nice pleasure I just had with my husband and enjoy this new pleasure. Because if I kind of held on to the old one, it sours. And it also prevents the new thing of just walking down a street we know very well. That so kind of, it kind of, it, it kind of just keeps you grounded in the moment. If, if you remember these things and when you feel these strong things, you say, nope, nope, let me get back to the center. I don't, I don't know. That's just what yeah. that's. No, I, I think that's, and by the way, one of my favorite cartoons, the New Yorker cartoon, and it shows a fellow sitting at a bar, leaning on the bar, having a drink, and he's talking to the bartender, and he says, I know that I'm nothing, but I'm all I can think about. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or thoughts? No? Back here? So, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, if I you say her, what, 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 Elizabeth, and then say. I just have a specific vocabulary question. Yeah. As we get down to the Eightfold Path under Samadhi, as we've been doing our studies, there's kind of a, cess a cessation component uh, preceding the contemplation. But here we have concentration and right concentration is this is, is this concept of concentration kind of picking up on that same cessation stopping the mind idea it's still stop stilling the mind it's stilling the mind yeah so that's yeah that, that's what going going to, to, yeah. in other words there's nothing else that's, that's occupying your mind so it's still it's stick, it's because still. you're concentrating okay, okay just wanted yeah. to check yeah. that yeah. sam you're you're going to say something sorry okay okay <laughs> Um, any other questions? Yes. We... I was going to answer Sam's uh, concern about say you have this nice meal. You're just supposed to forget it. You know, enjoy it in the moment and then let it go. But enjoy the walk back. Enjoy the walk back. Carry it forward. Yeah. yeah you, can, you can do two things. Don't dwell on it like for the next 10 hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know? That was really nice, but you know, <laughs> walking home, that's cool. <laughs> right. At the same time, I remember the wonderful quote from Bilya Sabarin, the once comment that I was sitting in this drawing room enjoying my supper. And someone said, you eat supper in the drawing room? He said, no. I had finished supper an hour earlier. I was sitting in the drawing room enjoying my supper. <laughs> right. Who was that? Bilya Sabarin. I don't know who that is. Famous chef. Oh. Okay. And, and wrote, I wrote a book on on food and sensual, the, na the sensual nature of food. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Did, uh, as we study Buddhism from the introductory, we learn the middle way being between the two extremes of aestheticism and, mm -hmm. and excessive consumption. Uh, and then we go on to learn how it unfolded as you just shared with us. Certainly, if I go to, if one goes into China, into Taoism, you start to pick up through Taoism, and even Confucianism, some Taoism, is um, two aspects and a middle way concept. So it's the next thing to be studied from the two extremes being two aspects of the same thing, the two truths doctrine. Again, we can borrow heavily into Taoism and maybe even say that it was influenced by Taoism. Back in Probably India, without a doubt. Yeah, so, so now let's go back to India. Um, did it ever get to the point where the two truths doctrine was actually coming out of some of the other teachings way back to 800 BCE? Otherwise, oh, I, 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 I really don't find that. Sense. You don't find it in Jainism so much. Well, there is, within within the Vedic, there are there are some of those ideas. Okay, you do find it in the Vedic. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Before so, before Buddhism. So so uh, Buddha waking up one day and saying, or actually the day before he woke up, <laughs> right. uh, the day before he woke up saying, uh, you know, the middle way. Yeah, not this, not that, the middle way. That was not a radical thought. No, and, and and as I'll say later in the in the uh, uh, Dharma, the yeah the the Dharma talk, there's a, you'll find it in virtually all. It's Aristotelian, sure. I mean, so it it you know you find it in Judaism, you find it in the Veda, you find it in Taoism, you find it in Plato. Confucianism, Pl Platonism, Aristotelian logic, etc. You know, yeah. 
it, w- it wasn't a new idea. I think what, and, and we have to remember, when you look at the four noble truths, the first two were not unique. The idea that life sucks <laughs> it was, was, was present in many philosophies. And the idea that, that attachments <laughs> are, you, you, make it so you, you create your own suffering. You create your own suffering. The suffering isn't necessarily imposed on you. Not to say that there isn't suffering that isn't imposed on us. But even if you didn't have that, you'd be making your own suffering anyway. So what Buddha's, the, 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 the fact that there is a way out of the suffering and the way out of the suffering is the middle way and the Eightfold Noble Path, that was Buddhist, right? right? Now, but, but you'll find lots of stuff that we, that we refer to in Buddhism that is found throughout other wisdom teachings. Yep. You know, that's, that's yeah, the Eightfold Noble Path. There are elements that is in, in a lot of other in a lot of other yeah, morality. I mean, right, you know, right. That's yeah. We also have to remember it's a process. The Buddha is did not come up with a complete set boom, the moment he had some milk rice. He realized that asceticism or sensuality at that point, as he grew stronger, were not right, and then he had to sit in the middle, but the rest of the philosophy develops as he's sitting under the Bodhi tree, which is a later event. It may be later by a day, but we're talking a process here. But but one could even argue if he had not been with those gurus for six years, would right. he even have been to the point that he would have come no, to that? No. That, but, but again, what we just talked about right. is an introductory Buddhist rap of right. that story. Now, let's tell the story that comes out of the Lotus Sutra, right. especially the second part of the Lotus Sutra. Uh-huh. You've got a different story. Very different story. Yeah. There always was a Buddha. Right. I mean, that whole story is just something that's told to little kids because they can't understand the big story. Right. Right. So we have this little storybook story of Buddha sitting underneath the tree waking up. That's not the story that comes out of the Lotus at all. Right. How many stories do we have? And, 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 and that's just a lotus sutra. <laughs> I kind of like the lotus sutra story myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring the discussion portion to an end and ask the folks here to go on out to the pondo. Okay. Uh, the Dharma talk for this evening is the middle way, as previously stated, is foundational to Buddhist teachings. The idea of the middle way is found in this is actually, we were just talking about this. The idea of the middle way is found in the golden means of Aristotelian philosophy, in the sacred works in virtually all religions, including Hindu, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, uh, Taoist, Confucianist, and philosophies around the world. That is to say, it's not unique. Because it is relatively common does not make it any less important. And it's also misunderstood. Moderation works fairly well in many areas of our life. And as I said before, we should emulate those. Eating too much or too little, sleeping too much or too little, be willing to compromise on those things that we can compromise on. There are many examples. I like the idea of the Goldilocks principle. And this is an analogy to the children's story of the three bears. The principle is used in cognitive psychology, astrobiology, medicine, economics, communication, statistics, on and on. In many uh, scholastic areas or academic areas of study, you'll find what they refer to as the Goldilocks principle. Speaking just for the Buddhist path, Shakyamuni Buddha referred to the excesses of sensual indulgence and the excesses of some of the ascetic practices. That was very specific. Where we should be careful is to recognize moderation is also a very specific, excuse me, is a very subjective notion. If we're discussing the environment and environmental disaster, which is upon us, what is the middle way? If we think of the middle way as middle of the road, we will not change the situation significantly or sufficiently 
to mitigate, remediate, and adapt the environment, which is clearly nearing the tipping point for human sustainability. We are on the edge. What does a middle of the road tell us to do would not be sufficient to change that. The dualities of environmental mindfulness are not a belief in climate catastrophe versus anthropo anthro climate change, climate change caused by people, and the denial of climate change. It is on one hand, eco-terrorism at one end of the spectrum, spectrum and reuse, recycle and reduce at the other end of the spectrum. In other words, reuse, recycle and reduce is a middle of the road approach, not a middle way approach. The middle way is an intensive, concentrated attention to the dangers of how we mitigate, remediate and adapt to a new reality. And we must be proactive and not reactive. What is the middle way regarding systemic racism? Do we need to pass more middle of the road laws to restrict discrimination in a piecemeal fashion while retaining the structure of racist policy and ideology that permeates our society? Many of us can still hear the hollowness of our and our previous generations claiming that we need to move slowly, not radically, in order to realize equity in our society. Well, how's that worked for us in the last 60 years? I know if you're black, not very well. If you're gay, not very well. Just in the last few years, gay people have been given some liberation, but they still experience discrimination in the workplace and discrimination in, in ways that I, I, I would not even be aware to be candid with you. Certainly in buying a house and things like that, it's still there. And so it depends on whether you wish to change to occur or to, return, to retain the status quo. One end of the dualities is white supremacy and racism and the other end of the spectrum is, I am not a racist ideology. The middle of the way, of, excuse me, the middle way approach is anti-racism and dismantling the racist white privilege structure upon which our society rests. We cannot allow our delusions to give way to a middle of the road approach to these important problems. We have to follow the middle way. To do this effectively, we need to pay attention to our Buddhist practices, Buddhist meditation, which incorporates the Buddha Dharma, to realize the nature of reality, Buddhist Dharma study to attain supreme wisdom, and working with our Sangha for support and nurture in order to fulfill our potential. We must recognize that we live in a samsara world as bodhisattvas, and these issues require bodhisattvas with commitment to relieve the suffering, the challenges of samsara. It is not an option. It is a sacred duty as part of our bodhisattva vows. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Thank you.